Holy Gospel according to Matthew. Lord, Lord. Jesus told his Jesus told this parable to his disciples. The kingdom of heaven will be like ten virgins who took their lamps and went out to meet the bridegroom. Five of them were foolish, and five were wise. The foolish ones, when taking their lamps, brought no oil with them. But the wise brought flasks of oil with their lamps. Since the bridegroom was long delayed, they all became drowsy, and they all fell asleep. At midnight there was a cry, Behold! The bridegroom came out to, the meet, to meet him. Come out to meet him. Then all those virgins got up and trimmed their lamps. The foolish ones said to the wise, Give us some of your oil, for our lamps are going out. <coughs> but the wise replied, No, for there may not be enough for us and you. Go instead to the merchants and buy some for yourselves. While they went out to buy it, the bridegroom came, and those who already went out to the wedding feast with him. Then the door was locked. <coughs> Afterwards, the other virgins came and said, Lord, Lord, open the door for us. But he said in reply, Amen, I say to you, I do not know you. Therefore, stay awake, for you neither know the day nor the hour. My sisters and brothers, this is the gospel of our Lord. Amen. Sing with her, 
and she was somewhat in a comatose state. Uh, but then when we were singing the familiar songs that she loved so much that we sing here at St. Matthew's, uh, she made every effort to sing, and before we left, she uh, was able to become alert, and she knew we were there, and she was able to say a few words, and, and what a blessing it is. But uh, as we were surrounding her bed with members of her family, uh, you could tell that she is a deeply loved member of that family. And it is such a difficult moment when someone has spent the course of her life, and she's lived 93 years, but the time grows short, and we know that she's going to be passing from this world. And even though she lived a long life, and um, I mean, not many people make it to 93, nonetheless, it's difficult to let go of someone you love, even when they have lived such a long time. Uh, those who are left behind when a loved one uh, dies still have to deal with that loss. And we never really get over losing someone that we love, do we? It, that loss stays with us the rest of their lives because a human person that we care about in our lives is irreplaceable. And so there will always be a vacancy in the lives of her family, a sense of absence. But as we were there and gathered around her hospital bed, joining hands, singing songs, and reciting those traditional prayers, because there's a point in time when you have no more words left, and you just say the words of those prayers that we have memorized since childhood, um, there was a real sense of, of hope in the room. And that is because, as people of faith, we have been given a great hope. I believe in the resurrection of the dead. I believe in the return of the Lord Jesus. These are words that you've heard before that we say in church constantly, and the familiarity of them may cause us to somehow grow indifferent to those words. But we are saying something, nonetheless, that is deeply profound. And it is this belief, this faith that we have in the second coming of the Lord Jesus, who is coming back for us, that is called the blessed hope. And so as the family of Ruth were gathered around her, they were not filled with despair, even though they were experiencing great sadness at her impending uh, departure. Nonetheless, they were not driven to utter and complete despair because within their hearts there is a living hope. And hope, my brothers and sisters, is not some kind of wishful thinking. Hope is not a weak virtue at all. It is a certainty, a confidence that is brought to birth within our hearts because of our faith. Faith, my brothers and sisters, is a gift, a capacity that the Holy Spirit pours out into every human heart. Without the Holy Spirit, we can't even begin to believe or have faith. Faith itself is a divine gift that is imparted to us. And faith is not just affirming some propositions or intellectual ideas. Um, it's not saying, I believe this, this, and this. Faith is putting your trust in a person. The biblical sense of faith is always relational. It's not what you believe, it is who you believe in. To whom do you put your trust? And if you put your trust in the Lord Jesus, and he's the object of your faith, you receive the gift of hope. For if you trust in him, and you believe these words, then you will understand that when he says he is going to come back, he will not leave us alone, nor will he ever abandon us. Then we put our faith in that word, and we have the certitude of hope. And hope and faith enables us to do something else. When you have faith, and when you have this great hope of the return of Jesus and the resurrection of the dead and life after death, then you are liberated. Right. 
Faith and hope liberates you. It sets you free from despair. It sets you free from fear. And when you're set free from despair, and when you are set free from fear, you are set free to truly love. Love in the deepest sense of that word. And so people of faith and people of hope have a great opportunity before them to make a difference in the world because you now can love others with complete abandon. You no longer, no longer have to hide in your insecurity and hold on to all your stuff, which by the way, you won't be able to take any of it with you. You don't have to be that way. You can share all things because you've discovered the one good thing and that is the reality of love. And when your heart is set free through faith and hope from fear and despair, then you are free to love others and that power of love opens the gate in which heavenly grace and blessing flows in a transformative way into our world. We become agents of profound change. We affect one another because faith, hope, and love are contagious. They spread throughout the human race from one person to another. And it transforms our suffering world. And it gives people a sense that God is at work in a hidden way to deliver on his promise of salvation for the human race. Does anyone want to say amen to that? Amen. Your life can be transformed into a life of extraordinary grace through these great theological virtues which we call faith, hope, and love. It is like another trinity. St. Paul said in his letter to the Corinthians, in the end, only three things remain. Not your bank account, not your house, not even your reputation. In the end, there's only three things that matter, and that is faith, hope, and love. And the greatest of these is love. That is the gospel summarized for you. This is why you are here today. Because you have received the gift of faith in your heart. And it was the Holy Spirit that prompted you when you got up this morning. I think I'll go to church. And you thought all along that was your idea. But you were drawn here to be in the presence of this community because as we gather each week for public prayer, my faith encourages your faith and your faith encourages my faith. We encourage one another and strengthen the bond of love that exists between us and we increase the gift of hope and faith within our lives. It is a good thing to come to church. It's good for your soul. How many would like to raise their hand and affirm it's good for your soul to be here this morning? Thank you. Did anyone not raise their hand? <laughs> Are you here as a mere obligation? <laughs> I believe in the second coming of Jesus. We profess this in the creed. I believe in the resurrection of the dead, and I look for the world of the life to come. This is at the very heart of the gospel of Jesus. And yet, it is something that seems utterly and completely fantastic when you think about it. After all, Jesus lived in ancient times in a world so far removed from our own. Can we as sophisticated people living in the 21st century be able to believe such a preposterous uh, suggestion that a man who lived long ago will come back again? Do we really believe that he was raised from the dead? These are questions that perplex our minds. And although our intellect and our minds will often doubt these truths, our heart knows better. Our heart somehow resonates to the sound of this truth because there's, all, there's some truths that are only rightly discerned by the human heart. The intellect can only go so far in analyzing reality. 
But there comes a point in time when you have to trust your heart because there's a limit to our intellectual ability to comprehend this world and this life in which we live. One of the things that we are told by the biblical witness is that we live in a world that is passing away. We live in an age that is coming to an end. Science verifies this. The world came into existence some 13.5 billion years ago in an event called the Big Bang. And we've been here, or the universe has been here ever since. But one thing that scientists tells us is that the world is fading away. It is in a constant state of passing away. Your life is not immortal. We begin to realize in the face of the loss of a loved one how fragile and how short life really is. The older I get, the faster time goes by. In a few moments, I'll be gone at the rate we're going. So life is temporary. The world is temporary. Nothing is permanent that we encounter into the world. We live in a world that is passing away. As George Harrison said in his song, all things must pass away, and we know this to be true. Even though I walk around in my daily life thinking that I look like I did when I was 21 years ago, I only have to look in a mirror and say, oh my God, <laughs> what's happened to that guy in the mirror? And the fact is, I'm aging, which means I'm terminal. We are all have the same diagnosis, we are terminally ill, and the time grows short for my existence on this planet. Everything seems so impermanent. Everything seems so fragile, and everything wears out and eventually fades away. But the New Testament affirms for us another reality. You see, we think because of our five senses, our sensory perception, that the world is real. And indeed, it is real. It is something tangible that we can see, hear, touch, taste, and smell. But the reality is that there is a world that is more real than the material world in which we live. It is the heavenly world, the realm of the spirit, that which we call eternity, which is somehow exists outside of the realm of time and space. And although my body is wasting away, and although the world is in complete decline, subject to corruption, I am aware that there is something else. I suspect there is another reality. And this reality is not perceived by the five senses, but is perceived by the theological virtues that we call faith, hope, and love. And love is the evidence that there is such a thing as eternity. Love is an eternal quality that always bear witness, witness to that life which lies beyond this life, that life which is beyond death. That is why when people die, we still love them. They die to us in this life, and yet our love for them continues on, and their love for us, we believe, continues on. And that love itself is bearing witness to an eternal quality. It points to another reality beyond this world, beyond the world of sensory perception. Is this helpful for you, my brothers and sisters? Amen. Does this encourage you? This is the word of the gospel. I believe in the second coming of Jesus. I believe in the resurrection of the dead. You know, in the ancient world, they had many customs and practices that we do not do anymore any longer. We have grown more sophisticated and more technologically savvy. And so in the time that the pages of the New Testament were being written, uh, it was a very different experience living a human life in many ways. And one of the great customs that occurred in the ancient world was when a king would go away from his beloved city. A king in the ancient world is a warrior. He often had to go to battle and he would be on the front lines unlike modern warfare. The king, the commander in chief, would be leading his troops in the battle in order to vanquish the enemy that is a threat to the city. 
And so when the king would marshal, marshal his army and he would go forth to meet the enemy on the field, he may go a far distance away beyond the sight of those he's protecting. And he may be gone for a long time because in ancient warfare, wars were not a short thing. They would go on perhaps for years, maybe even decades. And people in the beloved city of that king would wonder when he was going to return. They knew he was coming back, but they did not know when. But they were always on the watch for when their victorious king would return. And then, quite unexpectedly, word would come from messengers that the king is coming back home. That the king has vanquished the foe and he's returning victorious to the city. And what would they do? They would clean the streets of the city of all its refuge. Because the refuse, refuse uh, they didn't have swords in those days. So cities were quite filthy. And so they would wash down all of the walls. They would clean off the streets. They would deck things with garland of flowers. And then everyone in that town would be alerted as to the uh, return of their beloved king and hero. And then when the, uh, those who were keeping watch upon the watchtowers would uh, detect that in the distance the, the king is coming with his great procession, they would put out the sound of the trumpet and they would cry out the news that the king is coming. And what would they do? All of the citizens of the city would go out at the gate of the city. No one would be left inside the city. They would go out there in front of the, uh, the uh, main entry gate of the city and they would line up on the roadside and they would carry palms and, and, uh, and olive branches in order as the king comes and they would throw flowers. Uh, they were ready to greet the king with praise and acknowledgement and great jubilee and celebration. For they knew their king was victorious and he was coming back home. He was coming back as he told him that he would return after vanquishing the foe and it would be a great fanfare that he would be welcome. Does this remind you of a story in the life of Jesus? Palm Sunday. That was significant. As he was coming, riding upon the, the cult of a, of a young donkey, uh, they, they did this. They welcomed him because they thought he was the expected king. Now, things didn't turn out as they expected because God is full of surprises. It never goes according to plan yeah. or our plans. God has another plan that trumps our plans for life. But he was hailed and welcomed to the holy city of Jerusalem. It was his city. And after all, wasn't he the rightful king? And so this would be the great celebration. Now, there was a church in the uh, Mediterranean world that was founded by the Apostle Paul. It was in a Greek city near Macedonia called Thessalonica. And it was a small community, kind of like St. Matthew's. And they would gather for weekly Eucharist. And some of the members there was a new community. They had only been around a few years. And some of the members uh, who believed that, that they had the gift of eternal life because of their faith in Jesus, became worried because some of the members died. They died before Jesus came back again. And they thought they were eternally lost. They didn't have a, fully understand, a full understanding of what the resurrection of Jesus really meant and the implications of that life which is eternal. And so they were afraid. And so they wrote to Paul, and Paul writes back. And he says to them when he writes back, do not be afraid about those who have fallen asleep, those who have died, because they will be the very first ones to greet Christ when he comes again. And those of us who are alive when Christ returns will hear the final trumpet, the shout of the archangel, and he will descend from the heavens, and we will all go out to meet him, just like a conquering king. We will leave our abode in the comfort of our lives and we will go out and then Paul becomes very poetic as he talks about and we will be caught up. It will be
be such a rapturous day. That's why we call it the rapture. We will be caught up with those who have gone before us. The dead will be raised first. And those of us who remain living at that time, we too will be caught up. And Jesus will be coming back with all the saints. Every soul that he ever saved. And all the angels will accompany him. And it will be a great victory celebration. It's mythical language. It's language of poetry. Because the reality defies the imagination. We cannot even conceive of this. I believe in the return of the Lord Jesus. I believe in the resurrection. And now we come to the gospel. And the gospel is also using imagery that is based upon the customs of that day. It's about a wedding. It's about bridesmaids. You all know about a wedding day. Yeah? You all know about being a bridesmaid. Well, if you're a woman. And in the ancient world, when a wedding was contracted, the groom would meet with the bride and the parents of the bride, and they would stand across from each other in the village square. The rabbi would be there. The villagers would all be surrounding them. This was the day of their betro betrothal. And so promises and agreements were made. There was an exchange that went on. And so now this bride and this groom were legally bound to each other. They were betrothed. It was like engagement on steroids. Because you couldn't break that legal agreement. It was binding. However, they were not yet married. The bride would return to her father's home with her parents to remain there, and the groom would depart to go and prepare a place for his bride. He would have to build a house. If he already had a house, he had to do massive home improvement. He would have to visit the local Home Depot and collect all the supplies. This takes money, time, and effort. No one knew when the groom would be ready. He went to prepare a place for his bride. And so the bride's family and the bridesmaid always had to be on the alert and watching because they knew not when the groom could come. He would come in the middle of the night. He could come in the middle of the day, early in the morning. They had to be ready for him. And when he finally finished with the job of preparing a home for his bride, he and his friends would get together and in formal procession enter the village and go to the door of the bride's family, knock on the door, and the parents would then present their daughter, who is now the bride, of the bridegroom to the bridegroom, and then they would crown the bridegroom and the bride with crowns, oftentimes made of garland, sometimes with precious metal. A, a bride at that time would wear a headband with coins hanging from it. And this is what they did, and they would be treated as the king and queen of the village, and the wedding reception would last seven days. It was a great celebration. And the bride's family was responsible for that. Because the groom's been busy preparing a place. And that celebration would begin. And then he would take her home. It is against this background of this ancient wedding custom that Jesus said in the night he was betrayed to his disciples, his last night in earth. You believe in God. In the same way that you believe in God, believe also in me. He's not talking about ideology. He's talking about personal trust. As you trust God, trust me. In my Father's house, there are many dwelling places. If it were not so, I would have told you. And I go to prepare a place for you. You see, he's using wedding language. He's the bridegroom, so to speak. I go to prepare a place for you. And when I return, I will take you unto myself, that where I am, you also may be. He's using the language of weddings. He's using the language of the bridegroom and the bride. And everyone would then understand we know not when the Lord will return again. It could happen this afternoon. <clears throat> I hope you're ready. Or it could happen another 2,000 years from now or a million years from now. No one knows the day or the hour when the Lord comes. But it doesn't matter. 
He's coming nonetheless. This realm, this reality is passing away. We are at the end of the age. After 13 and a half billion years, this age of suffering, of pain, is passing away. For there is a new world coming, my brothers and sisters. There is a new age that has already dawned 2,000 years ago because Jesus was the first one to be raised from the dead. And just as Jesus was raised from the dead, so we too will be raised from death into life. To be absent from the body in death is to be present with Christ. But we are not to remain disembodied spirits. We will be clothed with a resurrected body, a transformed body that is of a reality that we cannot even begin to comprehend. What we shall become, we do not really know. But we know this. That when he appears, every eye will see him, and we will know him and see him as he is, and we will be like him. We will be transformed. The dead shall be raised, and those of us living at that moment will be caught up in a rapturous moment, and we will be transformed from mortality into immortality. Amen. For now, we look into a dim, dim mirror dimly. We don't see clearly. It's like looking through a foggy glass. But the day will come when we will see him face to face. And we will know him even as he is fully known. So Paul said, comfort yourselves with these words. The end is not. It draws near. We all have a case that is terminal. But nonetheless, we rejoice and celebrate. Because we have been given the gift of faith. And through that faith, we have the gift of hope. And we know these things are true. And because we have the gift of faith and hope, we are finally liberated to give our lives away to others in love. Because as we love others, we are loving God. And that is what gives meaning to this life, even as it passes from us. And that, my brothers and sisters, is the gospel of the Lord. Amen. Let us stand now and profess our faith.